Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our session on the um, uh, postgraduate exploration and the presentation uh, Macquarie University Master of Translation and Interpreting. Um, as my name is Mark Orlando, I'm the program director of the TNI uh, program here at Macquarie University, and I will be uh, hosting and moderating our session tonight. Um, we will, you know, look at um, having a snapshot of the program, but also the career options in this very specific area, specific and exciting actually domain of work. Uh, we will explore future opportunities and pathways to various career trajectories. Uh, before I start and introduce our guest, I would like to first of all acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia um, and their continuing connection to land, waters and community. And we pay our respect to them, their culture and their elders past, present and future. Um, so we will be with you for about an hour. Uh, 30 minutes will be dedicated to presentations and 30 minutes to Q&A. Um, tonight we will be um, talking um, with myself. I will be presenting I mean, uh, the program and um, the, the options within the course. Uh, we will be then speaking with Shuo. Shuo is an, one of our, alum, our alumni, so we will be talking about his experience in the TNI program uh, and what he's done since he's graduated. And then we're very lucky to have uh, Thea Dietrich with us as well, who's the CEO of 2M Language Services, and who will be giving you an uh, overview of the trends in the professions uh, from the point of view of a language service provider who uh, has a large and big reputation for many years in an international reputation because they have offices all over the world. So that will be uh, very, very interesting. Um, so just in case uh, you, know, you have questions, you can use the Q&A uh, chat box to ask your questions. We will have about 30 minutes at the end to answer all of them. Uh, and uh, just as well for your information, the session will, is being recorded. So if there's uh, anything you miss, uh, you will have an opportunity to go through again the recording after the event. Uh, if ever we do run out of time at the end, don't worry, we will have the opportunity to, or you will have the opportunity to book a one-on-one -on -one session and a personalized cons consultation if you want to ask and go through further questions uh, later on. So if that's okay with everyone, I will now um, start with the presentation of the TNI um, program at Macquarie University. So before I cover the course and what the course offers, I thought it would be a good idea to simply cover very briefly uh, the professions that we're talking about. Um, you know, very often people see translators and interpreters only as linguists or language spe specialists. I often prefer uh, telling students that, um, uh, you know, translators and interpreters are communicators. They facilitate, you know, communication between communities and people. They facilitate an equitable access to services, whether it is at a local level um, or in an international meeting, the, um, the, 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 the point is the same. It is, it is about facilitating communication between different parties. Again, just to um, set the scene and, and clarify things, you know, uh, for everyone, translators work from uh, written documents. Uh, they generally translate from their second language that we call B language in our jargon or languages, if they have several, into their A language. So if your A language is English, you would be translating from different languages, uh, or at least one and several maybe into English. Um, they translate all sorts of text and text types, and they use different technologies. Interpreters can work bi-directionally, most of the time, specifically in the private market, so into their A language and into their B language, uh, or if, when they work for institutions like the UN, the UN for example, uh, or the European Parliament, they generally work from different languages into their A language as well. Uh, and there are, in their case, different modalities, modes uh, that they can use, different domains of work, and it is important that you know about this before we, we start talking about uh, uh, opportunities in the, in the industry. Um, so again, if you want later on more information about the profession in Australia in particular, I definitely invite you to visit the two websites I've put here. One is the one of the National Accreditation Authority for TNI, NATI. Uh, the other one is about the professional association, which is OSIT. Um, now, 
what about our course? Um, so our course is um, definitely adapted to various changing, uh, you know, um, facets of the profession and the realities and demands of the professions. Uh, we work really, you know, carefully to equip um, graduates to be, of course, skilled to do these 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 jobs and uh, and 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 uh, what they will have to to um, to provide as as facilitators of communication uh, between languages, but also. Uh, having the right credentials. Um, so the course in substance is both academic and vocational uh, with definitely an angle towards practice uh, specifically uh, in the second year of the program. Uh, the fact it sits in a faculty which is very interesting uh, being the faculty of medicine, health and human sciences provides as well opportunity for interdisciplinary training uh, in specific domains where uh, translators and interpreters are in demand, uh, specifically health is, is an interesting one. Uh, we do have a very wide portfolio of um, uh, partners in the industry we work with, uh, government services, language service providers, uh, which is very good to provide practicum um, opportunities and internship opportunities for the students. Uh, we also have, of course, pathways towards a high degree by research, uh, a master by research and a PhD in translation and interpreting studies. Um, we work with students in state of the art facilities. We have specifically two uh, labs. One is a translation lab equipped with all software and um, technology needed for translators today for translation memory, for um, uh, machine translation, for the use of uh, audiovisual translation software as well. And for interpreting, we have a very specific uh, lab equipped uh, with audio and video uh, for um, interpreting in all its facets and in particular for our master of conference interpreting. Uh, if you want more details about all these different courses and, and what I've just talked about, there is um, a URL here that you can follow uh, to have more details. Uh, most of our staff, or all our staff, are scholars and practitioners. I've been an, an interpreter myself uh, for 25 years. I've worked in different countries and I still work as a conference interpreter on a regular basis. And this is the case of 95% uh, of our staff uh, who teach in the program. Um, so our courses are all endorsed by NATI at the highest level of certification. So it's important for, for you to, to know this as well, which means that the courses prepare um, students to sit the NATI certification test when they need. Um, we offer a grad dip in one year, a graduate diploma. Uh, we offer a master in one and, uh, one and a half year. Uh, we offer an advanced master in translation and interpreting studies, which is a two year degree and a master of conference interpreting, uh, which is also two year long. Uh, we also, and we are the only ones in Australia to do so, offer a graduate diploma of Auslan English translation and interpreting, which is a two-year uh, degree and taken only part-time. Uh, the languages we offer are always paired with English and they are here on the screen. So Mandarin, French, Japanese, Korean, Spanish, and Auslan for the grad dip in Auslan English. Uh, you have opportunities to do what we call a combined training. So translation and interpreting, which is the choice of most students. But we also have students who prefer doing translation only. Uh, either because they're not proficient enough or prefer simply working with text more than uh, verbal, if you want, uh, transfer. Uh, so we also have a translation only option for the grad dip and the one and a half year degree. This is just simply another snapshot to show you how, uh, you know, the course can uh, be taken. So there's a one year which is common to, the first year is common to all the different courses. And we move on after that into uh, different degrees. We also have options uh, for uh, longer degrees and specifically double degrees, one with the Master of Applied Linguistics and TESOL for teaching of English as a second language. And another one with the Master of International Relations. And you will hear more uh, about this in a few minutes. Um, so last but not least, so what's required and really highly recommended before you embark in a career like this one, uh, having a very strong knowledge of your own language is absolutely important. It's not only about your second or third language, it's really about your first language. You need to master it very, very well. You need to have a sound linguistic and cultural knowledge of your other languages, your languages of work. 
a large knowledge, knowledge base. We always say that you know, the translators and interpreters are press eaters. You need to know about the world affairs. You need to know about your own country. Uh, this is extremely important. You need to be open-minded, curious. Um, we always say that when we work, we become specialists among the specialists. I'm not a marine biologist and I interpret very often in marine biology uh, meetings all over the world. And I was not trained as a marine biologist, but I'm, I'm, I know how to do that in interpreting and I prepare. Uh, I prepare well. Reading skills are extremely important, specifically uh, in translation. Of course, we often say, uh, it is often said that um, uh, translation is the most intimate act of reading. And this is true, you know, translators have to really dig into the text to be able to transfer everything, all the nuances uh, uh, of the source text. You need to be a creative write, a writer and have, of course, good writing skills if you're a translator, good public skills and certain cognitive aptitudes if you work as an interpreter. Uh, in a course like ours, you need to be interested in new technologies. There's a lot happening in this profession uh, and technologies are not replacing translators and interpreters. The translators and interpreters have to know how to work with technologies. And this is why you need to have an interest and to be savvy um, with the use of um, technologies. An aptitude to make quick decisions is important as well in, the, in our profession and in, an interest in both theory and practice because our course, as I said, is academic and vocational, uh, using theory in a very applied way uh, to, to become a professional. So this was my last slide. You have the possibility to put questions about the course if you want to. Uh, and before we go further, I will um, simply, I mean, before we go to the q and I will simply now invite Chuo to tell us about his experience in the course. Uh, and um, I will mute myself while he's taking the floor and presenting who is and what is done. Over to you, Chuo. Okay, thank you, Mark. And hi, everyone. My name is Shuo Fang. I come from China. I enrolled in Macquarie University in 2018, and I just graduated from Macquarie University, the double master program, Master of International Relations and Master of Translation and Interpreting Studies. And I'm now doing a translation editing as a part-time job, and I'm currently also applying for a PhD. So the reason why I chose to study at Macquarie is like when the first time I knew Macquarie was when I went on exchange at Macquarie uh, when I was still an undergraduate. And I that the first time Macquarie University provided a wealth of units for me to choose, and I even did Latin. So Macquarie is quite has a quite liberal and a diverse environment. And so that's the reason why I decided to go back to Macquarie to pursue my master program. And therefore, Macquarie University has very good reputation for translation and interpreting training. So I did some research on this and I talked to um, some lecturers when I was still an exchange student here. So that's what I knew. And then Macquarie University was also quite unique in combining different majors across faculties so that students can choose to kind of equip themselves better for their future career. And it is quite suitable for me because it combined um, both international relations and translation and interpreting, and they are both of my interest. And my reason to study a double degree with Tina and I here is like, it's quite challenging. As you know, it's a double degree. So it's quite, um, I think it's a little bit intimidating for some students, but it is also very rewarding because, you know, for professional translators and interpreters, they are supposed to have very solid knowledge in one particular field, be it law or medicine, technology, or any particular field they really are they kind of have specialty in. And for me, it's international relations. So I'm more um, interested in international affairs. And for the double master program, the international relations, they provide courses on international law, security, sustainable development. So it kind of helps you to broaden your horizon and make you have a better understanding of the world and what's going on so that when you are touching upon those topics in your translation and interpreting, they are, con they are kind of complementary to each other. So for me, the highlight of while I was studying uh, and Master of Translation and Interpreting here is like, um, I won the OZIT Student Excellence Award, and I also uh, got a rewarded for Macquarie Award for Academic Excellence. And in addition, I went on exchange in Leipzig, 
on Germany under the Erasmus program and it was fully funded by the EU Commission. So basically it is very subject specific ex exchange program. So Macquarie University it is the only university that has the partnership with the EU in this program. So I think I was quite fortunate to have this opportunity to go abroad and see uh, how the European scholars were doing their own research and it also helps you to deepen your understanding in your own field. So for my own practical experience, I think the workload was appropriate. And we also got responsive and helpful feedbacks from our lecturers to help us to improve our linguistic skills. And we also have theory courses, which helps us better understand how translation interpreting work. And I have to admit this quite intense um, structure and we, we, we have to bear a lot of pressure along the way. But I believe this is also very exciting because you kind of been driven to read a lot and you, you have to cope with the different pressure, as you know, if you want to be a um, professional interpreter, especially in a conference interpreting, you must have the ability to handle the, the kind of sometimes overwhelming pressure on you. So I think that's important for you um, to get used to that kind of pressure and the double masters have the kind of pressure for you. And also for our MTI program, we place equal emphasis on practice and research. So I think that's kind, kind of a very good balance. So practice units like translation interpreting practice one, two, three, they prepare students to take NAT exams and get ready for their future careers if, uh, after graduation. And at the same time, we also um, place emphasis on research methods like TNI theories to help students, probably some students would continue their academic pursuit and they may kind of acquire skills necessary for their future like doctoral studies or master of research studies and i think it's a very good combination so i heard that some universities believe that translation and interpreting are just practice oriented but for us it's more like a balanced approach so lastly i would like to give you some advice if you are uh, kind of thinking about choosing our program. The first one is you have to be patient and persistent. There's no easy way out or any shortcut to improve yourself. So use your time wisely to consider whether you can pinpoint your interest in our own field and you have to improve your linguistic and actual linguistic skills step by step. And you also need to aim very high to fulfill your potential like I, I did both masters and for the first moment, I didn't know where it will go, but finally I made it, I survived and I thrived. So I think you can push yourself a little bit harder, but as hard as you could bear to kind of achieve great things for yourself. And I think Macquarie University kind of, um, I never regret studying here. It kind of really is a rewarding experience for me. Okay, that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ro. That was uh, that was interesting, and yeah, I think you've touched on very very um, interesting points here. And um, um, you know, we can definitely discuss some of these aspects further uh, with uh, with the students um, in a, in a few minutes. It's my pleasure now to um, introduce again Thea Dietrich, who's the CEO of 2M Language Services. Uh, again, she will tell you more about the company, but more importantly as well about the trends uh, in the industry uh, and specifically the needs uh, for from graduates, you know, when they graduate now. Being a translator and interpreter today has nothing to do with when we were trained, uh, you, were, you or I, you know, more than 20 years ago. Uh, it has changed quite a lot and I think it's very interesting to have you specifically speak about that. You were a trained translator and interpreter and you are the CEO of this company. Over to you, Thea, and thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, a big pleasure to be here. And, um, and thank you also, sure, you know, for your presentation and, uh, and congr congratulations also to your OSIT award. Um, uh, a fine example, and you've studied in Leipzig. So some of you may pick up my accent. Um, uh, I'm German, half German, half Finnish, was born in Finland, grew up in Germany and came to Australia 23 years ago. Uh, I'm a trained uh, translator and interpreter. 
and uh, and then I started my own business, uh, a language service company. I'm going to share my screen actually and uh, uh, take you a little bit on this journey because here you are looking at um, this fascinating, um, uh, you know, degree you might be doing, hopefully. But what then? You know, let's go and let let me take you uh, to this journey into the future. What do you do? So Schwab painted the picture of what it takes and what you need for this degree to study. Um, but what is then? What are the potential? Of course, the world's your oyster, but you might uh, come to a language service company, right? So, um, for example, to two on language services, um, this is our company. And um, there are different um, departments in a language service provider. There's the translation and localization department. Ours goes into 250 languages. Some only cover um, maybe five or specialize in 10 languages. Localization, maybe this is the first time you hear this word. Um, We've heard translation interpreting today. Mark already explained that. Localization is uh, not only translation. It means to provide, to really localize the content. So um, you take a website of an Australian company that produces some shoes or handbags, for example, and they want to go overseas. Um, so you can't just translate it, you know? depending on the culture and the target market, you need to localize it. So there's more to translation. Um, you go to the Middle Eastern market, maybe you have to remove the champagne and the bikinis, right? Or you go um, into, um, you know, into uh, the Asian market and the images will change to a European market. So, so I'm trying to paint you all the future um, places you might, that might interest you, that might jig you, jig you interest, where you go, I didn't know that by studying this here, this degree, Macquarie University, I could, I could go into this direction. So as you hear, localization, this is, has something to do with marketing, with international marketing. International marketing takes you to SEO, search engine optimization, because of course, you also want that that, trans, uh, that website you just translated, localized, right? Um, that has the right images, but that it has also the right keywords. So it's actually found by the people who are searching for that product. So again, this goes into one direction, international marketing, search engine optimization, localization, fascinating. So what I'm saying is mm, some of you might be really interested in language. Some of you might be really interested in cultures. You know, you can go anywhere with this degree. Right? So translation, localization, 250 languages, for example. And uh, then you have technical translations and transcreation. Technical translations is another department that is domain expertise or subject matter expertise. This is if you're really interested in, say, mining or finance or life sciences, or even go even more oil and gas or, um, you know, or dietary. Um, you know, so really specific. Um, what I'm painting you the picture of today is real life career opportunities, right? Not want to be, but these are subject matter expertise and we'll come to the language technology in a minute. But there are a lot of opportunities for very good careers in technical translation, right? Transcreation, what is that? Transcreation means we used to call it copywriting, right? You have a brochure, um, maybe let's say for Tourism Australia, and um, you can't just translate it because yes, it might be correct, but nobody would say that, you know? When I, when I transcribe something into German, I will be so very sober and not exaggerate and not put too many adjectives in there because the German culture, you know, finds it credible, less is more. But I might choose um, another language where I have to paint the picture with a lot of flowers, right? So, um, so that's transcreation. It's basically, cop it's almost copywriting in another language. Um, then we have audio visual localization, also called media localization, another trend in the industry, right? Because we read less and we watch more. We have videos for everything. You know, people don't go and buy a new car and then look in the manual. No, they quickly get their phone 
or even, you know, a lot of cars have that inside. Um, and they just want to quickly watch a video. Well, they have to be voiceover, dub, subtitled. So that's called media localization. That's another very interesting domain to go into. So again, if you're sort of inclined in production, that might be, some, might be something for you. Now let's go to interpreting services. You know, there we have on-site, which is face-to-face, -face, which you can imagine, especially those um, in Melbourne, um, COVID, you know, has, you know, made it impossible uh, in many places to have on-site interpreters at the moment. Of course, we have video and telephone interpreting services as well. And, well, and then there's language technologies. That's a whole other. So you see, I could be already here um, giving you on each one of those departments, you know, a, lec you know, a lecture and sharing with you um, what there is. But, um, you know, let's continue. We talked about industry expertise, this subject matter expertise. So here are um, just a few examples. I can, if, if, you know, if there is something you're, you're interested in, in a niche, um, there are, as I, I, I repeat again, uh, excellent, brilliant career opportunities for technical translators who are specialized in a field, who know that field. Um, language technology. What is this? You know, what is there? Well, secure, sophisticated translation environment. What does this mean? Hmm. Mark alluded that when we studied translation and interpreting, um, it was another context and it was another world. I mean, um, I even remember typewriters, right? So um, uh, gone are the days now that translators get the content to actually their home and translate it there. You log on to a secure environment, a platform, different platforms there are that are hosted on secure servers. Because clients, you have actually, and this is another fascinating um, aspect of a translator, you will, you will be exposed um, to so interesting um, content partly highly confidential IP that nobody else is allowed to see outside the company. So of course this has to be protected. So we didn't talk about this data security 20 years ago. It's very important today. Translation customer portal. Now we go into your other opportunities. Translator, we've seen the different parts where you could be, um, uh, you could be working interpreter as well. But what about going into project management? right, or into an interpreting, a coordination, interpreting management. Um, you might think, yeah, I like the translation interpreting, but I like the adrenaline, you know, of the actual management. Um, another career path, uh, project management. So with, as a translation project manager, for example, um, you would be familiar and you would be learning about the translation environment system, about customer portals, you know, um, how to, you know, how to um, uh, help clients to log on to a portal and uh, even ask for their, for their translation with their documents and have different solutions. So that's project management. You'd be liaising with those translators. And um, translation memory. You will be learning, obviously, about the so-called TM systems, the CAT technology, computer-aided translation. Um, you would like, for example, some of you might already be familiar with that, MemoQ, SDL, Trados, just to name two, MemSource, there are many. Um, translation API. Um, I can, um, uh, this is, we, we, we live in an ecosystem, right? So there are different systems, and today we start combining one system with another system through an um, application program interface and API. So um, these are translation APIs. So for those of you who are really technical minded, there's definitely um, a career path there. Let's come to custom machine translation. And what is this machine translation? Um, uh, we're not talking Google, no. Um, but even Google, some of you who, who are using it would have seen in the last couple of years that it has gone from what we used to have rules-based machine translation 
statistical machine translation, which is data, you know, data in, data out, um, to neural machine translation, which is based on natural language processing. Um, which sounds in some language combination for some languages, potentially depending on the source text, quite natural. Um, might not be correct, but could can sound quite natural. Um, this is where we professionals come in, you know. We use machine translation, we are adequate as a productivity tool. But it is our precious human mind, your precious human mind, that is very important. Yeah, even in all the technology automation, there is what we call in language technology, the human in the loop. And that is very prized. And that's where your career is as well. Because you're taking the, you have, you don't do the low level work. You do the, the intelligent work on either the technical translation or you're painting the picture with the copywriting or you create solutions or you take the machine translation and the translation memory that we saw, which is, you know, you, what your previous translations aligned, you know, the pairs um, lined up um, and, and, and optimize a machine translation to make it, you know, better. Um, and, and then go on to something called post editing, which is you look at the output and then you improve it so it is a human translation. That's another, that's another um, skill to have. Um, I'm pretty good at that skill. You know, I can look at a pre-populated segment and I can see um, if it is useful or not. So anyway, um, and then otherwise I can write it new straight away. And then remote interpreting and booking platforms. So that's project management. Um, and you, you can see I get excited um, uh, because of course I don't want to cut into um, your Q&A time where you can ask us all these questions, you know. So there's order processes. Um, there is, um, you know, here we see what a translation memory is, right? Um, it's like a linguistic database um, and um, translation APIs for those um, language um, uh, technology interested in you. Um, so maybe um, I'll just quickly show you what an interpreting today's video interpreting apps look like. Um, play the whole thing. As I said, promise, I'm not going to cut into Q&A time, but um, there are many opportunities. Um, the trends with COVID, as you can imagine, goes to video interpreting, RSI, remote simultaneous interpreting. The world is your oyster. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, uh, hand over to Mark, and, um, and looking forward to a healthy um, discussion with uh, lots of um, questions. Thank you very much, Thea. That was um, that was very interesting. And again, I think you've covered quite a lot um, in in a limited time. But I think it's good. It clearly shows as well those who are listening to us that uh, it is an extremely uh, varied and multifaceted uh, uh, area of work. Uh, when you consider all these facets of translation you talked about, when you consider all the various facets of interpreting we've talked about as well, I think uh, you know that clearly shows. Uh, uh, our attendees here that, as I said, it's multifaceted and, and you will certainly find what suits you. Uh, again, the training that we, we provide uh, at Macquarie University is also multifaceted and we touch upon all these different things that Thea mentioned, um, whether in translation, translation only or whether in translation and interpreting. So look, I can see there are already a few questions uh, in the Q&A box, so I will um, you know, start looking at that and covering them. Um, so one of the first questions was about how do you know if you are proficient enough uh, in, your, uh, in your own language or in your, in your second language or languages before going into, into something like this? So I will, I will um, uh, try to answer that one, simply telling you that if you want to embark in an interpreting career, 
uh, you need to make sure you can converse fluently in both languages uh, before you start your training. Of course, you will always have a, you know, you will be stronger and you will have more strength in your A language, but even your B language, you must be able to converse, uh, you know, and to go quickly to make decisions to, to, to clearly, you know, be natural in the way you express yourselves. The difficulty of the terminology is not necessarily a problem because you prepare and as an interpreter, 99% of the time you can prepare for the specific assignment and job that you have. Uh, and you will be taught as well how to prepare, how to gain that, uh, uh, that knowledge that you do not have. But definitely uh, the, the fluency uh, in the conversation is, is one important thing. We, we, we often say, and I want to insist uh, as well on that, translation and interpreting training is not language studies. We generally train people to become professional translators and interpreters. They must have the language proficiency right before they start. Of course, your language uh, proficiency will certainly uh, improve somehow, specifically when it's domain-based, domain based, but, uh, but you must be able, uh, you know, whether you speak, for example, Mandarin and, and English to be able to converse in both before you join uh, the program. In translation, very often you would be translating into your A language, so that would be certainly your ability to read uh, any type of text uh, from uh, uh, from an interview to a very complex uh, financial text or legal document to be able to read all sorts of text that you will uh, translate into your, uh, your, your A language. Um, some markets require that you translate into your B language um, specifically, and for those of you who have English as a, as a, as a first language, there's a shortage of uh, English A translators and interpreters A uh, sorry, English aid interpreters in the world. That's why in some markets, uh, translators have to translate into their B language. That's the case in many countries in Europe. Uh, that's the case in China uh, and in other Asian countries. Uh, but um, yeah, so if English is your A language, you would definitely um, make, you know, you will definitely have, have more opportunities probably than, than many in, in translation, at least in interpreting as well. Um, so I hope it answered that answers that first question. Um, Second question is, have you identified any new trends in the translation profession and how graduates could better prepare themselves to be more employable? Uh, maybe we can start with you, Tia, on that one. You know, if you would, and I'll ask Cho as well, Cho as well what has been his experience so far. So uh, how could graduates prepare, prepare better themselves to be more employable? Thank you. So for the translation, as I mentioned, um, to be able to and this is terminology if you like the word post-editing, but it is very, you will have to use uh, machine translation as a plug-in within your translation environment platform that is expected today, unless you have a certain language combination, um, really, um, but in, in all standard languages, unless it is a marketing uh, text, but um, if it, otherwise it is expected. Um, that means as a productivity tool. And it is also expected that um, you're fully responsible for an excellent translation. So um, you cannot say, well, if I had translated it from scratch, it would have been better, but you gave me pre-populated content. No, this doesn't, you know, it doesn't work. Um, you are, I mentioned that precious human brain before. You take the decision. You will be getting, um, you will be environment platforms because they're hosted in secure servers because people don't want their own IP in people's personal computers. And it will be pre-populated most of the time with machine translation. And you will learn um, to post edit, to look at it and to immediately see this helps me. If not, scrap it and you write your own translation. And if not, you know, but it's a productivity tool. So this is very important. It will be easier for the people who are using, for the students who are starting to uh, study translation now than for us, who we had to pivot and adapt. And we, we were very judgmental about it as well for many years. But, um, but if you have any, so this is my, if you have any judgments over uh, language technology, throw them right now, package them up and throw them out of the window because you will be, and it will be your precious human brain. But nobody's going to pay you to translate. The cat is black, die Katze is schwarz. A machine can do that. 
Oh, what you sure? Thank you, Tia. Um, one thing, again, for example, that we were not trained to do uh, when, when we were trained as translators and interpreters um, a few decades ago was, for example, project management. This is something now that five years ago, our industry partners were telling us, your students are not trained to project management. We really have to train them uh, when, they, when, when we employ them. Now, this is embedded in the training as well. So just to simply show you how things change and, and adapt. Uh, both in training and, of course, based on the demands. Sure. What has, what have been your what would be your answer to that? How can you prepare yourself better to be more employable? I think the for students like if they are really want to um, equip themselves with necessary skills, and they really need to follow the instruction from our lecturers. I know that some students they they don't really not they don't really like the technologies. Like we have the four hour seminars for technology training and they feel like, like Memsos and Trados and they feel quite boring and they believe they can still use very traditional way of editing like words, like so, so very big form. And for students, if they are this, I think for some students, um, if you, uh, for, at least for me, I think the language skills is quite important because um, I actually, the, the part-time job was recommended to me by other students to me because, and I didn't get naughty for now because I have to like wait in lines for the test. But um, I did the translation test and I passed it. So that's the reason why they employed me. They believe that I am equal to that task. And I think for students who are not that sensitive to technology, you have to learn the basics of those you at you have to be quite adaptive and at the same time pay more attention to your linguistic skills i think because we do language we just have assignments every two weeks so some students they may become like uh, a little bit lazy when when it comes to assignments you have to drive yourself to do more and expose yourself to different materials to actually really perfect perfect your skills i think Thank you. Yeah, I think I will just uh, add one or two things here. Um, you know, definitely making sure that you maintain your linguistic level in both languages is something yeah. that is uh, that is very important. You can lose a language, you know, very quickly yes. uh, if you don't go back to your own country too often, or if you don't read, uh, you know, things about your language or your languages on a regular basis. Uh, you can lose that quite quite quickly. So it is very important. And you're absolutely right on the necessity to be versatile and adaptable. And this is why, of course, like this one as well, trains you to all these different things and that changes from one day to another. I've realized that often we think that youth are more technology savvy than we, we for example, are uh, older people. And I realize when I'm in training that it's not necessarily the case. Actually, young people are limited. They are very good in the technology they master, but yeah. they're limited in the number of technologies that they master. Yes. Uh, we're probably, and translation and interpreting will force you to definitely broaden your, uh, your horizon. Thank you. Next question is about, would it be good to combine any of these PG courses, for example, TNI and conference interpreting? So maybe we were not clear, or I was not clear when I presented. Conference interpreting is one of the, 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 the potential pathway in the Master of Translation and Interpreting. The two other double degrees we, we mentioned is the one Schwo did, so international relations, which is an excellent complement to uh, training as an interpreter in particular, or a translator, but definitely as an interpreter. Uh, the one with the Master of Applied Linguistics and TESOL is also very interesting. Uh, the use of English as a second language, for example, and how that can complement uh, TNI is an interesting thing. So again, it's longer because it's going to be three years instead of two. But uh, yeah, double degrees are, I think, a good, very good value in terms of the skills that are taught and the transferable, if you want, skills that you will have uh, as well for any profession in the future, uh, given the scope is quite uh, quite broad. Um, I'm moving on. Uh, I think we've covered that more or less, but I'm happy to still say with the increase of technological interpreting tools and applications as they get better and better, how do you see the future employment prospect for interpreters? So I think uh, Thea covered already quite a few things about that. I've also mentioned that we have this saying in the profession at the moment is that translators and interpreters will not be replaced by a technology, they will be replaced by translators and interpreters who use technology. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's very right. Um, what happened with COVID has shown something in interpreting that we were all reluctant to accept, which is, for example, the possibility to work remotely. Uh, there are many now international meetings that are run 
with what we call RSI, remote simultaneous interpreting, and it was not really possible before, but you still need the human. Artificial intelligence is making progress every day, but far, far from what a human can, can, can do. And I think Thea touched on that as well. Do you want to add something on this, Thea, as well? Because I know it's one of your, uh, uh, I realize we have about only uh, 15 minutes to go on, but would you want to add something on this? Yeah, just confirming um, for this question about technological interpreting tools. Um, uh, where uh, the increase of these tools are, is in the delivery of the interpreting rather than in the interpreting itself. Uh, we're very limited yet in live um, uh, neural machine translation interpreting because it that exists as well. Um, results are very, very limited because they are basically speech recognition going through machine translation and then going back into so that loop. So uh, yeah, so the, the increases are really in the uh, interpreting delivery that Mark just said. And of course, again, no judgment here. Um, RSI, remote simultaneous interpreting is here to stay. And, um, uh, but it means a lot more opportunities than before. And um, with uh, technical um, expertise, I just urge you to either you have in translation, you know, either you can paint the picture and, and you're a storyteller, right? Or you have technical expertise, but just to be able to even interpret. The cat is black, die Katze is schwarz. Um, you know, we don't need an interp neither an interpreter for that anymore. So, so we do want to, to, to you to use that precious linguistic brain. You know, one, one interesting sen uh, yeah, sentence or, 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 or quite quotations we have in interpreting is that we don't interpret uh, words, we interpret IDs. So uh, yeah, AI is far from being able to get all the nuances, humor, um, um, re some reasoning, uh, and some reasoning being linked to cultures as well. And we know that some, some, uh, you know, some people reason in a specific way because of the way they grew up and they've been trained, other people you know, I work a lot in the French English uh, lang language pair. Uh, and um, uh, for example, people who speak French in the Pacific, uh, the sp Pacific Islanders from French Polynesia or New Caledonia, they, their reasoning is very different. It's culturally, uh, uh, you know, built differently than a French person. So this is the type of things, if you haven't lived in that, in that area, you can't know, and a machine will never know that. So anyway, that's one exa example among, among others, but, um, uh, but I think, yeah, I think, no, we, we, we're here to stay. Our professions have changed, that's for sure, because of technology or thanks to technology, but uh, I think we're here to stay. Can you share your sh thoughts about future opportunities from a domestic candidate's perspective? Sorry, I've, I've missed. Uh, so. um, I've studied BA and fluent in Japanese, so um, future opportunities. If you're fluent in Japanese, you need to be trained as a translator and interpreter, and then uh, I think your opportunities will just simply come. You are in a good region here. You know, Australia has a lot of exchange with Japan. We know this, uh, and there's a lot of needs in, in, the, in that language pair. Um, uh, from um, a language service provider's um, uh, uh, point of view, Tea, Japanese English, um, where, where do you see most of the work? Yes, um, and again, um, it, do I read this right, that um, this is an A uh, language, uh, so English native speaker. Um, I just would like to say to all these English uh, native speakers on this um, course today, it's excellent, you have excellent career, everybody looks. Can I just say, English is the most underestimated language in the world, and if we're looking at statistics and metrics of language combinations or even pricing, we all know Scandinavian prices, Japanese translations are more expensive than Spanish, it depends on all uh, availability, they are based. English native speakers are sought after so much because um, because of course nobody beats a native speaker who actually understands the source language. That doesn't happen that often. So you often have to get a non-English speaker, a non-English native speaker because they understand the source language. So there are excellent opportunities for English native speakers in this industry. Information number one, that's really important. Uh, Japanese as well, you can go into industry you know, there is in life sciences, depends on different sectors in marketing. That is, um, so uh, the, they're very good. And you say, I studied, um, you know, um, so is this business administration? Um, what, what is no, it's a Bachelor, bachelor of Arts. In, in, um, in uh, for Japanese. 
like you know so yeah excellent opportunity i mean uh, i invite everybody also get in touch with me i'm happy to um you know to share more afterwards because i know we're limited with time but um you know they're quite specific um you know uh industries and sectors uh that deal a lot with japan and that will be that will be very useful there thank you um if, yeah, okay, so we've covered that one. Which one did I forget? Have you identified any new trends? I think we've we've covered that as well. Um, how can graduates prepare themselves? I think we, we covered that. Now, I'm not quite sure whether I would like to do translating, interpreting in a community commercial area or would like to work with the larger institutions, conferences and things. Um, I, I have a few things to say about this, but I would like Cho maybe to tell us, um, have, you, have you had to make such a decision or you simply plan to go with the flow and, and, and take what's, uh, what, what comes or are you planning for one specific area? Um, I'm quite adaptive. So basically now, because of the impact of the COVID-19, I think I will seize whatever opportunities that present themselves to me. So be it commercial or community or in different settings, I mean. So do not kind of uh, limit yourself to a particular field very early. You, you can help have a chance to experience like interpreting different settings like when we do um, translation and interpreting practicum, we have the unit for that. And you have the opportunity to engage in community services and that will give a feel for what a community interpreting looks like. And I think you don't need to rush to that kind of decision. And really you have to pinpoint interest after you have tried different settings. And I think that's, yeah, that's the. Yeah, I, I agree, and and I and I would simply as well go back to the question, and uh, uh, you know, depending where you are, I think makes a difference as well. Depending the market where you are, when you're in Australia, you will definitely, as an interpreter, if you're based in Australia, you would you would work uh, as I do for international meetings, uh, if you want, as a conference interpreter, if you have the opportunities. But you could also be in the court if that is what you want to do the next day because you would do court interpreting and then you may if it is still something you are uh, you know wanting to do you could be called uh, to go and help uh, you know uh, interpreting in a in in a, in a medical setting um, um, you know then there's the you know melbourne tennis tournament the australian open every year and then they call you to interpret for you know one press conference at the tennis as i, as I do quite often here in Melbourne. So, you know, it, it varies. It depends uh, on, on thing. And I think when you're based in Australia, that's the beauty of it. In some other markets, you would probably need to specialize. Uh, but again, it depends. Um, uh, and here we're talking about interpreting. Uh, in translation, I think many people tend to specialize because it's good to have your value as a specialist in one or two domains, for example, and some people want that. Uh, in interpreting, I have colleagues in Europe who do only conference interpreting. I have colleagues who do only business interpreting. So I think it really depends. But in the course, yes, about the terminology, about the, the specialties uh, or the specialization, let's, let's say. Uh, yeah, we train you to these different areas so that you have a broad knowledge and understanding of what it is and what it means to interpret or translate for one domain or another. And, uh, and, and this is... Um, uh, that this is what the, 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 the training is about as well. You know, it's to show you how to use your skills in different areas. Um, so again, you don't have to make the choice uh, beforehand. Um, I'm just coming back to one question that we haven't touched upon, which was people asking if you can do two, uh, for example, B languages and English. Uh, you could do that in the program. The only thing is that it will double the amount of work that you would have because all our courses are taught in English and another language. So if you have English and Japanese, you will be doing your uh, interpreting classes and workshops in Japanese English, your translation in Japanese English. Then if you have Mandarin on top of that, you would have to do double work. What I often say and, um, to people is that when we train interpreters and translators, we don't train them to languages. So once you have been trained, in one language pair, if you add languages to your language combinations in the future, the training remains the same. It's just the language and the culture that changes. And you will have, you will have that will be your responsibility to make sure that you are proficient enough in the language and you, in your cultural understanding to do the job. But the training as an interpreter, for example, or a translator, because it's skill-based, the skills are deployable for or usable for different languages. Many of my colleagues have added 
languages over the years. You know, they can start with two or three languages and in some areas, depending on their lives or, you know, life is unpredictable, you can add languages, but that doesn't mean you have to retrain. You just simply make sure you are proficient enough and cultural, uh, culturally, you know, uh, uh, as well proficient enough before, before doing the work. Um, I don't think there are any open questions here. Um, we have three minutes. I don't know. Um, maybe I start with uh, Thea. Do you want to add a few words just simply to wrap up? Thank you. Um, know your tools. Uh, for those who are going to be with translators, know your tools, you know. It's very, very important. It gives you power. It gives you um, uh, the skill paths in the career. You have to. Uh, for translation, interpreting as well, it'll be different tools, but in any case, one practical advice, um, you know, know your, absolutely know your tools uh, in terms of the technology. Um, any of you who have any judgment over um, technologies um, uh, like machine translation, uh, you don't know what you don't know. So take them again, pack them up, throw them now out of the window, you know? Because it is your, nobody's going to take your precious human brain. Um, and I say for the very last time, you know, the times are over. Nobody's going to pay anyone to translate. The cat is black, the cats are schwarz. You know, you have to, it is the concepts Mark talked about. It is the recognition of that, or it is the technical uh, expertise, or it is you as the solutions architect, you know, who brings it together. You're a consultant. So the world, nobody's taking anything away from, uh, translators, interpreters, and all the others in, uh, stakeholders in our industry, but the skill sets are changing, the jobs are changing. But have fun with it. Thank Thanks, Thea. Shwo, in one minute. Um, I think, like, just take your time and get yourself prepared, especially be open minded. No matter what a cha changes or opportunities come to you, you have to be adaptive and make sure that you keep practicing. I think that's important. Thank you, Shwa. Um, yeah, and, and from my point of view, I can clearly, you know, tell you this is a very exciting um, uh, profession. It's, it's, there's so much to do that changes all the time. The, the topics, it's at the crossroads of absolutely everything. And it's, that's why it's so fascinating. Uh, and then when you're trained, you can choose as well. It's, uh, it's, it's really, you know, uh, it's, it's what it is. Sometimes people think being, being based in Australia is a problem. Actually, think about it. You know, when people are sleeping at the other end of the world, you are doing the translations for them here in Australia. When they wake up in the morning, it's on their desk. You know, before joining the academia, I was a freelancer, full-time translator, interpreter. 80% of uh, the translations I, were, I was doing at the time were with clients in, I was based in New Zealand at the time and in Australia, were with uh, clients in, in Europe and in Northern America. So it's, it, can, it can be an asset to be where we are as well. So, uh, uh, so you know, don't think we are, we, we, we have, you would have to move from here. For interpreting, it's a bit different, but now with, um, you know, remote interpreting, it also becomes a global, a global profession. Um, before we wrap up, I just would like to remind you, you know, that uh, you can book one-to-one um, -one session if, uh, if, you, if you have more questions. So, um, uh, you know, you have this on the slide right now. Uh, feel free, you know, to, to contact us and uh, I'd be more than happy as well to, to go further, um, um, you know, into, into this with you. Um, Thea Schwo, thank you very, very much for your time. Thea, Thea, I know you're a very busy CEO, so thank you for this hour that you, you spent with us. As usual, it's very, very, uh, you know, interesting and, um, and beneficial for all of us. So thank you. Schwo, all the very best. Stay around and come to talk to our students in the future as well in, sure. in, in seminars that we, that we organize. But uh, uh, yeah, all the best with your, with your career. Thank, thank you. you very much. And thank you as well to the organizers at Macquarie of this, uh, of this evening. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Have a Good great night. evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye.